He is the host of PBS's Tavis Smiley and Public Radio International's The Tavis Smiley Show. So you will not be surprised to hear that his name is Tavis Smiley. Cowardice ask, is it safe? Expediency ask, is it politic? Vanity ask, is it popular? But conscience ask, is it right? And every now and then we must take positions that are neither comfortable, safe, politic, or convenient, but we do it because our conscience tells us that it's right. Those are the words of the person I regard as the greatest American, my personal assessment, the greatest American this country's ever produced, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. If you, thank you, if you were going to appear as a guest on my PBS program, or my NPR program, and you had written another book about Dr. King, I suspect my first question might be, does the world need yet another book about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? I want to answer that question this morning from my perspective in just a moment because this is a book, uh, Death of a King, uh, the real story of Dr. King's final year. It is a book that has not been written, a book that will introduce you even after almost 50 years to a king that I suspect that you and most Americans do not know as yet, but the time has come. Our conscience tells us that we have to wrestle now with the message that King left us. I believe that the future of this great democracy is inextricably linked to how seriously we take the life and the legacy of this great American, Martin Luther King Jr. And so in the few minutes I have, I want to try to unpack a, a, a bit of what this text, Death of a King, is about, but I want to do a couple of things first, if I might. First of all, um, someone once said that life is not so much about the breath that we take, but about those moments that take our breath away. And for me to appear on this stage this morning is one of those moments I know that I will look back on years from now as a moment that took my breath away. How I wound up on a stage with this great star of stage and screen with three names, Neil Patrick Harris. I do not know, but I'm honored to be in your presence, sir. Um, Angelica Houston just presented so beautifully, and it is always amazing to me to watch generations of families who, in love and service to the rest of us, share their artistic uh, gifts and their genius. And I'm amazed always by her work, but this, this lineage, this legacy, that she is such a beautiful and rich embodiment of. I'm honored, Angelica, always to be in your presence. And thank you for that wonderful presentation you just offered a few moments ago. And, and what do you say about what every one of us in this room who writes wants to be a perennial New York Times bestselling author? Lisa, we are all trying to catch up to you. And, uh, I'm delighted to be on with you. I'm also thankful this morning for the invitation by this wonderful convention, this annual gathering. Um, but I'm cognizant of the fact that I'm here uh, because someone at Little Brown had the good sense or uh, they were blindsided just enough to think that if they put my name on a list, somebody might choose it to be on this stage today. So let me thank, since we know how this process works, the publishers uh, in this town and around the country submit names and some secret committee somewhere decides <laughs> who actually gets on the stage. But I know it started with, with Little Brown, the publisher of this text, Death of a King. So let me very quickly thank and acknowledge the CEO of Hachette, Michael Peach. Let me thank Reagan Arthur, the uh, publisher uh, of Little Brown. Let me thank David Vigliano, the agent on this deal. And most importantly, uh, aside, uh, along with all the rest of the team at Little Brown, uh, let me thank the editor who has shepherded this project uh, to the market, my friend John Parsley. Please thank the team at Little Brown for being here this morning. I listened to Angelica read that wonderful poem by Maya Angelou. And I am reminded this morning that I am who I am 
because somebody loved me. And whether you know it or not, you are who you are because somebody loved you. We, every one of us, is who we are because somebody loved us. None of us walks this journey alone. We are inextricably linked to the love and the service of others. And this moment is a bit surreal for me because when we lost uh, Dr. Angelo yesterday, who I just spoke to days ago, uh, we knew that she was ill, but you never close on the death of a loved one like you close on a house. And so even when you know it's coming, it's hard to kind of process. I am who I am because somebody loved me and Maya Angelou loved me. When I was just a kid, a black kid, in case you couldn't tell, <laughs> I've been this way for my whole life. I was a black kid raised in north central Indiana in an all white community. We were the only African American family in an all-white community. And that is the way I was raised. Um, that is the way I went to school. Um, that is the community that produced me, this all-white community in the cornfields of North Central Indiana. The only relationship that I had to the outside world, the broader world of, of Negroes, was through reading. And I fell in love with poetry at a very young age. And one of my favorite poets and one of my favorite poems was written by a woman named Maya Angelou, and it was called Still I Rise. Still I Rise. And it told the story of how against all the odds, she found a way to rise. And that your attitude is really the only thing that determines your altitude. You have to find a way to rise. And there, were a lot of, there was a lot of confidence that was born in me because of the conditions the very poor conditions. I'm one of 10 kids, my mother, my father, my grandmother, big mama, 13 of us living in a three bedroom, one bathroom trailer in a trailer park. That's how I was raised, 13 of us, three bedrooms. My seven younger brothers and me had one bedroom. My two sisters and big mama had the second room and obviously my parents had the third room doing a lot of procreating to have 10 kids. <laughs> But there were 13 of us in this three-bedroom, one-bathroom trailer. And so it was really through reading that I got a chance to know that there was a world out there beyond my immediate surroundings. And that poem, Still I Rise, uh, convinced me that if I worked hard and did what I needed to do, at some point I might be able to see beyond uh, my community in this cornfield of North Central Indiana. Fast forward a few years, I'm still a kid. Who knew that I would ever get a chance not just to meet my Angelo, but to have her invite me on a trip with her to Africa. I'm just a kid. It's my very first trip to Africa. For two weeks, I am traveling through the continent, literally carrying my Angelo's bags, just following her around. But every night and every day, sitting at her feet, listening and laughing and learning and loving on her in Africa, my very first trip. I've now been to 16 or 17 African countries, traveled with presidents and interviewed all kinds of folk on the continent, but my Angelo took me there first. And so it is surreal for me to be standing in this place this morning at this convention um, as we celebrate her life and her legacy. And I want to say a word, and I hope this will be received in the spirit that I want to offer it. It's not enough for us just to celebrate the life and legacy of Maya Angelou. We have to dig a little bit deeper. You know her backstory, you know that classic, still now international best-selling text, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. That book resonates because in the book she tells the story of growing up in a segregationist Jim Crow, and might I add Jane Crow America. She tells the story of finding her own voice for years Maya Angelou, for seven years, she did not speak as a child. She didn't speak. But oh, how, as time went on, she not only found her voice, but she shared that voice with us in countless texts. And as inspired and enlightened and empowered so many of us, never mind our race, color, creed, sexual orientation, she's inspired so many of us with the richness of her creative and artistic genius. But she had to find her own voice. 
I hope this morning that more than just celebrating her, we recognize that every one of us in this great nation has a voice. Each of us, let me put it this way, each of us has a thumbprint on our throats. As surely as our thumbprint on our hands make us uniquely different from anybody else in the world, that unique thumbprint that is only yours, we also have a thumbprint on our throats. And each of us has to struggle to fight, to rise through whatever conditions we find ourselves having to fight through, whatever journey uniquely we are on. We have to find our voice. But every one of us has a voice. Put another way, each of us has a story. Put yet another way, each of us is a story. And I want to, with all the humility I can muster, encourage those of us in the publishing world, those of us in this book business, to make sure that we work just a little harder, that we find a little bit more courage, a little bit more conviction, a little bit more commitment, that we dig a little bit deeper into our character to help so many other fellow citizens of color who have stories to get those stories told. Those stories have to be told. Maya Angelou is the quintessential example of that. She's not the only one. Too often we make the mistake. I've had to deal with this in my own career as the first African American to have his own daily show on NPR. The first African American still now to have his only nightly show on PBS. Uh, and I'm not that old. I mean, it, it just, just happened a few years ago. I've only been on PBS 11 years, and I was the first Negro through the door to have his own show. So there's a lot of work to do in this multicultural, multiracial, multi-ethnic America. And I don't know how we think that we're going to navigate ourselves into the future. There are all kinds of issues that this industry is up against. But how do we honestly think we cannot be stuck on stupid as to think that in the most multicultural, multiracial, multi-ethnic America ever, we are going to navigate ourselves into a future if we ignore what the country looks like. This industry and the books that we publish and the books that we sell have got to reflect a broader understanding of the diversity and the inclusion that is America. And I hope that beyond the platitudes, that if we really want to do tribute and justice to Dr. Maya Angelou, that we will take the example that she set seriously, that others have voices, others have stories, and those stories need to be told. It's rather easy to make the connection in the seven minutes I have left, rather easy to make the connection to Dr. King because Maya Angelou is one of only a couple of Americans who was uh, so honored to have been invited to participate in the home going, as we say in my community, in black America, we like to use that phrase home going. There, uh, it might be a funeral service to you for us, it's a home going. Uh, Maya Angelou, one of only a couple of Americans invited to speak at both the funeral of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Now you figure that out. Uh, but Maya and Ozzie Davis, if you were wondering who the other was, invited to speak at both of these home going services. So it, says a lot about the bridges that Maya was always uh, connecting and crossing, that Malcolm was her friend and that Martin was her friend. Uh, in, in 1968, when King is gunned down on that balcony in Memphis, he is murdered, he is slayed, as you heard Angelica reference in her talk, on April 4, the day that Maya was born. King is assassinated on the very day that Maya comes into the world. And so there was always a connection between King and Maya. And every year from 68 on, Maya had to deal with this burden of celebrating her own life, but doing so against the backdrop of having lost one of the world's great leaders on the very day that she came into the world. And yet from 68 on, she continued to find a way to rise and find a way to break through and to share with us lessons of love that we need to embrace. And so the connection between uh, Maya Angelou and Dr. King is, is quite profound, even as we celebrate her this morning. But this text about Dr. King, Death of a King, before I take my seat, is a book, as I said earlier, and this was not hyperbole, I'm not just trying to spin you. It is a book that I believe has not, it's not been written. I've been a student of King since I was a kid. Again, I'm in 
the cornfields of Indiana, and I'm reading everything I can get my hands on, which isn't uh, not a whole lot to choose from in, in the libraries uh, in Indiana about black culture, but everything I could get my hands on. I had a teacher in the second grade that said earlier, we are who we are because somebody loved us. And the first person I knew who loved me beyond my immediate family, not that it should matter, but you'll take my point, happened to be a white woman named Mrs. Vera Graft, my second grade teacher. And Mrs. Graft told me as the only black child in that second grade class that I was as good as, I was as smart as, I was as capable as anyone in that classroom. And she said to me, Tavis, you are going to quit quitting. You're quitting on me. You're going to quit quitting. You are going to deliver for me the expectation I have of you, the same expectation I have of everyone else in this class, and your race, your color, your being the only one in this room is not going to be an acceptable excuse. I knew in the second grade that Mrs. Vera Graff loved me, and she had high expectations for me, and we stayed in touch until she died just a few years ago at 92 or 93. And every time I went back to Indiana, I would go to the nursing home and spend time with Mrs. Graft and how proud she was that this little kid in her classroom had grown up to try to do something meaningful with his life. But more importantly for me, it was the acknowledgement that there was something in me that I had to offer that Mrs. Graft saw. Uh, and so Dr. King had the same view of what every one of us has to offer. And I found that in reading and listening to the audio of him as a kid, there was a, a, a member of my church who had collected some recordings. Barry Gordy, a founder of Motown, uh, used to have a team of people that followed Dr. King around and would record uh, many of Dr. King's speeches. He was always on the road talking uh, almost uh, every week of the year. And uh, the Motown team would follow and record him. And so Barry Gordy, years later, put out some, um, uh, some records of King's other speeches. Now, I know y'all think like most Americans, the king only gave one speech in his life. <laughs> and I know you think the speech only had one line in it. <laughs> that I want my children to live in a nation where they'll not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I ain't going to ask you to go no further than that. <laughs> but he gave more than one speech, and the speech had more than one line in it. And thankfully, Barry Gordy followed him around to record this. And so there's a member of my church who bequeathed to me this box of King LPs and so as a kid I'm not just reading King but I'm in the floor of my parents home uh, playing the phonograph the old LPs and I'm hearing the richness of his voice I'm hearing the love in his heart the hope in his soul and that infuses in me something that wants to help me learn everything about this man so I become a student of King at the age of 12 and I've never stopped studying. I'll be 50 in September, but since I was 12, I've been studying this man King. And over the years of my broadcast career, 20 plus years now, I have interviewed, I think, everybody who was close to him or knew him who has been living. I've made it my mission. And yet all these years, with all the speeches and all the studying and all the learning, I've never sat down to write a book about Dr. King until now. Why, Tavis? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the reason now is because I believe very quickly that King has now been sanitized and sterilized and even lionized in a way that does not allow us to see him for who he really was. It's easy to see him as a martyr now. It's easy to give him a memorial in Washington, a postage stamp, a holiday on which most of us do nothing but take the day off. We're trying to honor Dr. King almost 50 years after his assassination can I be frank about this? We're trying to honor him on the cheap. We're honoring him on the cheap because we really have not yet come to terms with the message he was trying to deliver 50 years ago. It's what King called the triple threat. The triple threat that uh, is going to destroy our democracy. I believe that the future of this democracy is inextricably linked to how seriously we take the life and legacy of King. What was that triple threat that King tried to get us to wrestle with? Racism, poverty, and militarism. Fifty years later, where are we now on racism, even in the era of the first black president? Racism, poverty, 
and militarism, when you think about it this morning, are still the very three issues that threaten to tear this country apart at its very fiber. Racism, poverty, and militarism, even with Obama's speech this week as the backdrop of what will happen in Afghanistan. Racism, poverty, and militarism. So we can honor him with schools and streets and bridges and all the other uh, accolade, but yet we've not come to terms with what King really tried to get us to deal with if we are interested in saving this very democracy. This gap between the rich and the rest of us cannot continue to grow this way. You cannot sustain a democracy with the kind of income inequality that we are just now getting around to having a pseudo conversation about. And then we don't want to call it poverty as King did, we want to call it income inequality. Well, that's, free, that's real. But the new poor in this country are the former middle class. And so we got to move beyond just talking about income inequality to talk about the poverty that threatens our very democracy. Poverty is now a matter of national security in this country. And King tried 50 years ago to get us to deal with that, and we didn't want to hear it. Look at all these military excursions that we've wasted money and time and treasure and American lives on. 50 years later, we are still not coming to terms with how this military industrial complex is destroying the very fabric of this nation. And racism, again, even in the era of Obama, there are examples every day. We see them every day of how we still have so much work left to be done. Let me tell you before I take my seat what happened to King and what makes this book uniquely different. When King, beyond the fight for civil rights and the fight for voting rights, which he, along with Lyndon Johnson and others, were successful at getting passed, we just celebrated, We're celebrating now, 50 years of the passage of the uh, Civil Rights Act and 50 years since the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and so we have these major anniversaries that we're celebrating this year and next year with regard to those two pieces of seminal legislation. But when Martin moved past voting rights and civil rights, keep in mind now, he gives the I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington in 1963. He's dead in 68. He lives five years after that march. There was so much work he was still doing beyond the moment that we have frozen him in our minds in time. But when King starts talking about racism and poverty and militarism beyond voting rights and civil rights, which didn't cost us anything, we just had to do the right thing. But you start addressing these other issues, now there's some cost, even some economic cost, that the country needs to deal with that we weren't prepared to talk about. So Martin King starts talking about these issues, and here is essentially, in a nutshell, what happens. Everybody in the country turns against him. The White House, LBJ, who has worked with Martin King in the last year of his life, disinvites him to the White House. He can't get in the White House. That's the administration. The media turns on Dr. King. Why? Because on April 4, 1967, here in New York, at the Riverside Church, he delivers the most controversial speech of his life called Beyond Vietnam. And in that speech, he calls this country, at the height of that war, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. Now, we all know 50 years later that Martin was right and everybody else was wrong. Even Robert McNamara, the defense secretary at that time, has now acknowledged how wrong we were on Vietnam. There's no debate about that. But when Martin comes out, this black man comes out, he's a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, but they tell Martin, Negro, that ain't the lane we let you run in. It's okay for you to run in the civil rights lane. You stay out of foreign policy. You don't talk about our budget priorities. Martin said, and he was right then, he's right today, that budgets are moral documents. Budgets are moral documents. To quote that great philosopher, Jay-Z, <laughs> you can say what you say, but you are what you are. And when you put your budget on the table, we see your priorities, because budgets are moral documents. Negro, we haven't given you the right to talk about the budget priorities of the country. Stay in your lane. Racism, we just passed voting rights and civil rights. Stay in your lane. You were not authorized to talk about these issues. So the White House shuns him. The media after that speech, the next day after that speech here in New York, 
they turned on him. And I'm talking about the liberal media. When you read in this book what the New York Times said about Dr. King the next day, when you read what the Washington Post said about King the next day, and every major paper in this country, they tore him a new one the next morning after this speech. So the White House turns on him, the media turns on him, white America turns on him, and sadly, even black America turns on him. When Dr. King dies on that balcony in Memphis, these are his poll numbers. Nearly three quarters of the American people had turned against Dr. King and thought he was irrelevant. The last Harris poll, 75% of the American people thought that Martin Luther King Jr. was persona non grata, but it gets worse in his own community of African Americans who he gave his life for. Almost 60% of black people thought he needed to go somewhere and sit down. Martin Luther King was persona non grata. When he dies on that balcony in Memphis, he has no idea that we would be deifying him the way we are all these years later because we turned on him. We, sad to say, helped to kill Dr. King. And it's only by resurrecting what he was trying to get us to really come to terms with for the betterment of this democracy that we will ever do the kind of justice to him that he deserves. And so this book, Death of a King, starts with King at the podium on April 4, 1967. And it walks you up day by day for 12 months, literally to the day. He gives that speech April 4, 67. He's dead April 4, 1968. And this is the kind of story that the country hasn't come to terms with about what happens to this great leader that we think we know in the last 12 months to the day of his life when he tries to get us to deal with the issues that almost 50 years later are threatening our very democracy. I close on this note. It's not just the story of King that you don't know that the country needs to come to terms with, but it's a cautionary tale for us right now because there are persons in our society today who are trying to get us to wrestle with uncomfortable, inconvenient and unsettling truths about everything from immigration to climate change to global warming to poverty and beyond. And if we continue to turn a deaf ear and a blind eye to these persons who are courageously trying to tell us the truth about these conditions that are going to threaten the existence and the future of this democracy, I shudder to think what happens to us, what we're doing to our own peril by ignoring these truth tellers. So I close where I began. Cowardice ask, is it safe? Expediency ask, is it politic? Vanity ask, is it popular? But conscience ask, is it right? And sometimes we must take positions that are neither safe, politic, comfortable, or convenient, but we do it because our conscience tells us that it is right. Now is the time for all of our consciences, individually and collectively, to get us to look anew at who King really was, what King was really trying to say, and have a conversation about what his real contributions were, and whether or not 50 years later, we're prepared to take that message seriously. To my collaborator, David Ritz, in his absence today, I thank him for his hard work on this text, but most importantly, I thank all of you, and all of you for giving me a chance to say a few words about this. Thank you very much, and keep the faith.